Good afternoon. This is Jack Rogers, Editor-in-Chief of Business Facilities Magazine. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Wayne Township, New Jersey. I want to welcome everyone to the second webinar of Business Facilities COVID-19 Response and Recovery Webinar Series. Before we get started, I know that everyone who's listening today wants us to take a moment to express our gratitude to America's healthcare workers. We're waging a courageous and determined fight on the front lines against COVID-19. We thank all of these heroes. Today's webinar, The Road to Recovery, is sponsored by the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce in Florida. At the end of our Road to Recovery webinar presentation today, Helene Castletine, Economic Development Director of the Indian River County Chamber, will tell us about the great work the Chamber's been doing to support the community's COVID-19 response and recovery. Just a couple of housekeeping items. You'll note the uh, control panel on your screen. Uh, you can submit questions using the uh, question box. You can send them over at any time. We'll try to answer as many as time permits. Uh, there's also the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Uh, that can either expand or collapse the control panel, and you'll need to have the panel expanded in order to access the uh, question box. Uh, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, just send a message to us uh, using that question section, and someone on our team will answer you privately. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who is joining us from her home in Tampa in the Sunshine State. I'm sure a lot of us would like to trade places with her right now. Aaliyah Newbold is a principal at Ryan LLC. She's a CPA in Ryan's Credit and in Incentives Unit who specializes in federal and state planning for her clients. Uh, she negotiates credits and incentives for new and expanding companies nationwide. Clients of all sizes from a wide range of industries seek out Aaliyah's more than two decades of professional experience. Uh, before joining Ryan, Aaliyah was a member of the National Tax Accounting Groups for both Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers, where she worked. That's PricewaterhouseCoopers, where she worked in the Washington D.C. National Tax Office. Aaliyah has been a speaker at Business Facilities Live Exchange event. We keep bringing her back by popular demand, and I'm pleased to tell you that she will be making a presentation at our. 2020 LiveX event, which has been rescheduled for September 27th to 29th at the Valentine Hotel in the Queen City, Charlotte, North Carolina. And we all hope to be there. Today, Aliyah is going to help us navigate the alphabet soup of federal programs that are helping businesses survive the COVID-19 crisis, and also to begin the road to recovery, including the PPP and the retention credit, as well as some new loan programs that state EDOs have created to augment this federal assistance. We've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, good afternoon, Aaliyah. Good afternoon, Jack, and greetings from Florida, where the beaches are slowly reopening, we are happy to say, and thanks again for everyone for joining us. As you can tell, we have a packed agenda. We really could cover an hour on each of these topics alone. And also, uh, it's titled after the CARES Act, but it could almost be titled the aftermath of the CARES Act. If you've been looking into each of the nuances, new guidance comes out almost daily from either the Treasury, SBA, or the IRS. So that's sort of the first thing I do when I log off at night and the uh, or the last thing I do at the end of the day, and then also the first thing I do the next morning, and they even come out with guidance off on the weekend. While many American businesses around the country are struggling due to the effects of the coronavirus, the government responded by passing the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities, or the CARES Act, on March 27th. Seems like a long time ago at, at this point. While much of the CARES Act was focused on providing forgivable, small business loans via the Paycheck Protection Program. Another part of the act included the new employee retention tax credit that could help business sizes of uh, businesses of all sizes. So there really is something for everyone in the CARES Act. 
We'll recover a refresher on the family's first credit because that does interplay in both the retention and the PPP program, as well as the EIDL or EIDL program through the SBA. And although those applications are only open right now for agriculture, we'll talk about how it does interact with the PPP program if you received it or if you've already applied and you're waiting. And then time permitting, I have a feeling we'll get a lot of questions, Jack, but time permitting, we will cover some state and local programs. It'll at least be a good reminder to, to uh, not limit yourself just to the CARES Act. And then at the very end, we also have a useful um, uh, a link for use, uh, kind of frequently um, asked questions link that both the IRS and Treasury has posted. I do need to start off kind of reminding everyone that, again, the guidance is frequently changing. So if you happen to listen to this on a, on a replay, it could become out, outdated with, within a few days. Jack, you may recall, we talked about doing this in, in June even, but we tried to move it up given the PPP program was, was reopened um, a couple weeks ago for their application. And there's going to be another, uh, probably another big federal package uh, coming out in the next couple of weeks once they start arguing about it. Yeah, well, they have started arguing, yes. Yeah. This may take a little bit longer um, for the next phase. Maybe they'll call that the phase five update. Um, but here's kind of a little quick history lesson on the most recently passed act, the Paycheck Protection Program. And health care enhancement. The president signed it on April 24th. Uh, the PPP reopened, I think it was on April 27th. So pretty quickly thereafter, uh, both the SBA and Treasury are tracking how much is left or how much they've actually been approved. Um, and we all had uh, wagers that the programs would all be fully exhausted by now. So it is actually interesting that there is still PPP allocation and likely part of the reason why, and we'll touch a little bit on it, is uh, some of the large organizations have had to give their um, PPP funding back once additional guidance came out. Uh, but we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But before we jump into the Phase 4 and the CARES Act, I think it's worth revisiting the Families First Act, which does provide uh, a payroll credit for sick leave for employers under 500 people. And this happens to be one where you can take or a company can receive both the Families First payroll credit and PPP, but you just can't use the same uh, wages. Uh, but we are seeing how this sick leave is all impacting us. A lot of small businesses have actually had to close down, not having enough uh, people to cover the staff. That included my local Starbucks here in Florida. And then some of my larger companies, uh, although they're under 500, still kind of larger locally, have had to add extra staff anticipating um, people taking sick leave because you could take it off whether you needed to quarantine yourself or you had a sick family member or because schools and daycares were closed, you were un unable to come to work. Um, the employees were required to provide sick leave uh, but they were, uh, the news isn't all bad because there's actually a payroll credit that can cover uh, the amount of the wages for that period of time. So we've done a, a few frequently asked questions here. And for this particular credit, it is a dollar for dollar credit that's taken against uh, employer social security credit obligations. And again, it is a, a refundable to the extent the credit offsets the amount of the total wages. Uh, now, one of the first benefits of the CARES Act that does apply uh, for all employer sizes, that includes the delay of employer tax payments. Um, this is a cash flow savings for all businesses, which relates to the delay of employment taxes for employers. Although this can provide significant cash flow savings, companies should be prepared to plan for the payments. The 6.2% of employer tax due for the period March 27th through the end of this year, December 31st, 2020, can be paid back in two installments. The first half at the end of 2021 and then the second half at the end of 2022. 
There are a couple of catches here. If you receive the PPP uh, loan, then your forgiveness is, um, or then your delay in the employer tax payments, it's not a forgiveness, is only until the point of your PPP forgiveness. So it could be at least a short period of cash flow savings, but something to keep in mind. And you'll also want to work closely with your payroll tax providers. Employers need to notify them to take advantage of the program. It's generally not something you want to do automatically, although I did have a client who mentioned their payroll provider did process it automatically, and um, but that wasn't sort of what they had chose to do. And then also you have to keep in mind you need to keep track of these deferrals that's currently not disclosed on the Form 941 or 940s that get filed. And, make, and if you change payroll tax providers, making sure you're keeping track of those payments due again in 2021 and 2022. But this has been a significant cash flow savings uh, for companies of all sizes. Aliyah, if I could just jump in with a quick question. Do you, sure. are you concerned that by, by moving up the uh, deferral, uh, when somebody gets a PPP loan that they're putting a lot of employers in a position where they're, they're really going to get socked with uh, with renewed obligations uh, just as soon as the uh, the bridge loans expire. No, you're exactly right. Although I almost get more concerned of them delaying it into 2021 and 2022, and although they are likely a crew for it, um, you know, it will if. Well, whether they'll have the cash available to, to pay it at the later date as well. Um, but there is a lot of uh, nuances and interplay with these programs and trying to maximize cash flow. Some are only timing, and then some are, are permanent type benefits. But that's a, that's a great question, Jack. Thanks. The next opportunity is the retention tax credit. And that it could be up to 5,000 or 50% of the wages paid up to 10,000 of wages. This is another interesting program. It was modeled after the other disaster credits that were an income tax credit, but this was a uh, savvy upon uh, Congress's part in order to get immediate cash flow and recognizing many companies may not pay federal income tax in 2020 by taking the benefit on the payroll tax uh, return. In order to be, first you gotta make sure that the business is eligible, which means a government order would shut down the operations or you were partially suspended or your gross receipts declined by 50%. We'll kind of go to the next slide here. And then it also depends on your business size, uh, which wages are qualified. So the smaller businesses that are under 100 employee, employees, they can actually take the benefit whether the uh, employee was providing services or not. But for our, uh, companies on the call today that have over 100 employees, it gets a little more complicated when you have to look at where they not providing services. And it's, uh, we'll go through an example when eligibility is revoked. Even though you're eligible, uh, once you have a decline of 50% gross receipts compared to the comparable quarter in 2019, you're able to take the benefit to the point when you are above 80%. So we'll go through an example that I think kind of best illustrates that as well shortly. Similar to the family's first credit, you could take the benefit on Form 7200. That can be filed um, each month if needed in order to get, get quick cash in, but it can also offset your current cash flow when you're paying in uh, your employment taxes with each paycheck, so whether that's weekly, bi-weekly, um, or monthly, and then you file your 941s generally on a quarterly basis. I think we've covered some of these items here. I think some of these are best to illustrate when we get into some of the examples. But also you need to keep in mind you have to bifurcate your wages so you can't take a retention credit on the same wages that you took a family's first medical leave credit 
And similarly, if you already take the uh, work opportunity credit, you're not able um, to take the retention credit. And so you need to look at your wages and take the one that's the most beneficial. Generally, Families First allows 100%. And then the next one would actually be the retention credit at 50%. But once you've capped out at your uh, 5,000 of credit, then you could look in to see what other credits could be available on those remaining wages. But just keep in mind, you can't kind of double dip these. And you actually can't take the retention credit at all if you have a PPP loan. So again, not even if it's not forgiven, if you have a PPP loan, you cannot take the retention credit. Who, Ali, if I could just ask you a quick question. Who is uh, administering all this? Is this going through the Small Business Administration, the IRS? Uh, uh, and the reason I ask is because uh, here in New Jersey, the the unemployment uh, agency is just totally swamped. They're, they're about two months behind. So uh, just wondering who's where, where the oversight is. That's a great question. Fortunately, with this program, because it's payroll tax related, it is the IRS and all these forms are with the IRS. And uh, employers have some flexibility to maximize those savings by not submitting payroll tax liability for the portion uh, of the credit. Obviously, a 50% credit or 100% on Families First would be uh, greater than the tax liability due. And so that's why they've actually come up and kind of leads into this slide. There's a separate form 7200 to ask for any excess. If, if it happens to exceed the amount of actual withholdings that would be due. And we expect these to be processed pretty quickly as well. Uh, but this particular mm -hmm. program and each program does have a separate organization. Uh, we'll talk about the EIDL program, which is the SBA, and then the PPP program is both banks, SBA, and Treasury combined. And we may see the IRS getting involved in those as well when they start looking at auditing some of those uh, larger claims. I hope they're increasing the number of auditors. This is when we'd want them to, right? I don't think you'd ever thought you'd say that, Jack, right? But, no, uh, no. I can guarantee you I have never said that before. <laughs> and you may never say it again. Uh, but keeping in mind, uh, what are the qualified wages? So it, that actually starts for this program uh, after March 12th, so they should have just said March 13th, through the end of the year, December 31st of 2020, or and this is just the way the IRS likes to word things, or before January 1st of 2021. And then the other thing to look at is uh, trying to define when you are, uh, when the business is partially suspended for the purpose of the credit. The operation is partially suspended if an appropriate government authority imposes restrictions limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings uh, due to COVID-19 um, where you're not at normal capacity. But there's some this particular section, consultants like myself thought it would be have a nice broad application, but unfortunately they've come out with some questions that limits that this applicability, which we'll go through shortly. Aliyah, just uh, one quick question here from an attendee. Uh, are these employer credit programs available to a 501c6 organization? Yes, they are. They are available for tax-exempt organizations because they're still having to pay, um, obviously, wages and are able to uh, are, are have to pay withholding and, and federal-type taxes. So this, these are available for tax-exempt organizations. Thank you. Looking at a significant decline in gross receipts, it's interesting the way they've defined this. So it's the first quarter in which you're less than 50%. Uh, most of the virus started impacting businesses in March of 2020. So this particular test is unlikely to apply, although naturally it could, for your first quarter of uh, 2020. Uh, but again, you'd want to look at it because at least here, this is a less uh, subjective type type test. It's more a 
numerical and, it, and if it applies, and then you're able to take it until the gross receipts ends with the first calendar quarter that follows, kind of hopefully you can see some, tried to bold some of the items here, the first calendar quarter in which the gross receipts are greater than 80%. So the best way to actually look at this would be to look at an example. But in general, almost everyone will at least get two calendar quarters being applied if your second or third quarter was less than 50%. And again, we'll kind of look at an example here and um, not reading the whole thing, kind of focused on the percentages. But if we are looking at first, second, and third quarter of 2020 compared to the comparable quarters in 2019, so the first quarter was down 48%, but then we were able to recover in the second quarter. I think what this will really more play out to be is more like second, third, and fourth quarter of 20, 2020 compared to 2019. So hopefully things do recover quickly um, for, for our purposes. But you'll note here, based on this example, though, they are able to take the retention credit in the first and second quarter if they met this gross receipts test. We've had lots of companies that have closed even though they're essential businesses. And turns out based on the frequently asked questions, if you're an essential business and you still closed, then generally you'll need to um, qualify under the gross receipts test because you'll, um, uh, you weren't closed as a result of a government order. You really closed um, based on your own preference. And you can't qualify just for closing on your own, uh, but you can under the gross receipts test. Uh, so we'll start to get into some of the frequently asked questions here, and we've talked about this, but can an employer take both the family's first and employer retention credit? And although you can take it a company can take both, just not on the same wages. So usually you'd have your uh, medical leave on the first two weeks, for example, at 100%. And then you could look at taking the employee retention credit, 50%, you know, up to 10,000 of wages. So just kind of keeping that in mind. We are finding that a lot of the larger payroll groups are automatically applying the families first assuming that you've reported that those wages were sort of sick leave COVID-19 related wages. They're calculating that automatically. But because of all the nuances, whether you qualify for the retention credit, they're not calculating their retention credit on, on their own. You have to actually tell them what uh, portion should be retention credit eligible. Looking at another question, we kind of mentioned this. If a government order requires a non-essential business to suspend operations but allows essential business to continue, is the essential business considered to have a full or partial suspension of operations? And this was a little um, unusual we, that they did come out and say no, that they would not qualify in this case for the essential business. But again, they could qualify if they've met the gross receipts. Here's another question. If a government order requires an employer to close its workplace, but they're actually able to continue telecommuting, does that count as a suspension of operations? And actually, unfortunately, no. If you're able to basically relocate your employees from, their, from your workplace to home, uh, then you're not able to take the credit. But again, you can take it if your gross receipts have been um, have been impacted. But this is actually more favorable. Let's assume a business has uh, operations nationally, and every state, unfortunately, has their own kind of stay stay home order or businesses that can open. And so you may have in some locations some that were required to close and some that were not. And in this case, you could actually, we, well, before this question came out, we thought you'd have to look at it location by location. But here you can aggregate the location, and because some were required to close, then the business would be eligible, uh, which again means you wouldn't have to meet the gross receipts test uh, by itself. 
you could look at taking the credit if some of your locations had to close, but not all. So that was uh, some good news, at least. This was an interesting uh, response here. May an eligible employer treat wages paid to employees pursuant to a pre-existing vacation, sick, or personal leave policy. So a number of furloughed businesses allowed individuals to take their uh, sick leave first so that they could get some wages paid during that time period. And turns out, unfortunately, and, and again, most of my questions are geared towards employers that have more than 100 employees. There are different tests if you're smaller, but I've noted the question here and the answer for less than and more than 100 employees is listed on the IRS website. But again, this focuses on if you have more than 100, those particular wages would actually not count if they're taking you know, pre-existing vacation and sick time. Um, sick although we time, had an interest including in sick time. Right. So if the person came down with something the day before everything shut down, there it's not going to count. But you could take the families first if you have less than 500. But if you have more than 100 and you're basically uh, taking your pre-existing sick time or um, uh, sort of a bucket of sick leave that they give you. Um, again, this is just for the retention credit. Families first would qualify oh, for less than or 500 employees. Uh, but it was actually, we found that an unusual um, response, and the interesting thing, we'll get to the questions in a minute, they've already changed course since they posted some of these questions, which we'll get to uh -huh. shortly. Uh, so these could these are subject to change, uh, and they already have from from last week. Uh, may an eligible employer treat payments made to former employees who were terminated as qualified wages? So it, this was another interesting one where um, you you didn't just furlough them. You've unfortunately they they were they lost their job, but you may have paid them a, a severance policy then you're actually uh, not able to count those wages either. Uh, we had a question come in where they had terminated someone and they typically gave them a lump sum and they thought, well, maybe I should pay them out over a period of time instead of a lump sum, but unfortunately, um, it, it doesn't matter how, how it's paid out if it is uh, for a terminated employee. Next question, are wages paid by employer to employee who are treated as related? So this is interesting. We get a lot of PPP related party questions. There's currently no limitation for related parties, but there is for the retention credit. So I won't read um, all of these, but I just wanted to point out, you do have to um, be careful when you're paying uh, pay wages to related party. They did not qualify for the employee retention credit, which, you know, a lot of uh, family-owned businesses uh, or small businesses may be family-owned, and here they're kind of limiting that applicability for the credit. Next question. Does the amount of qualified health expenses include both the employer and employee portion? So this was good news in that it, it does include uh, both for, for the credit. Uh, there was some question really whether the employer side would qualify. Uh, we knew the employee side generally would qualify because that's just coming out of their regular wages. But here, qu qualified wages, even though the employer portion is not taxed, to the employee, which a lot of our credits are generally based off of kind of W-2, box one wages. So this is very favorable in that you're able to take both employer and employee costs for health care. But this is one of the questions where they updated it because uh, a lot of furloughed workers are being provided health care, but only health care, so no wages. And notice this was updated on the 7th. Prior to the 7th, it actually said if you were only paying health care, it did not qualify. But again, this was um, recently updated to be more favorable. And it's interesting, you know, the IRS is coming out with the rules. So Treasury passes the act, 
um, and uh, uh, the IRS, you know, sort of interprets it and puts out guidance, you know, frequently asked questions posted on the IRS website has the lowest level of sort of authority, uh, but but without any other guidance, it would it would generally uh, probably weigh pretty favorable in the IRS's standpoint. But fortunately, they quickly reversed course and again allowed um, healthcare costs only being paid while employees furloughed is eligible for this uh, credit. So in this case, they were protecting employees. Right. Exactly, but uh, the IRS had to change course there. So next question, does the employee retention credit reduce the expenses that an eligible employer could otherwise deduct? So it basically means if you have a $100 credit, you have to reduce your expenses by $100. Otherwise, they actually view that as kind of double dipping, taking a deduction and a credit on those same wages. Uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation Report uh, had some good examples, and I wanted to remind everyone, because I don't think we actually covered it on another slide, and I get these questions a lot on the PPP side, can I, during my um, eight-week loan period, give employees a wage or a raise for hazard-type conditions? And then under the retention credit, which again, if you have PPP, you can't even look at the retention credit, so the retention credit limits the amount of wages that you could take the credit on for the um, amount of wages paid the 30 days preceding the period that the employer was eligible. So there's just a quick example of originally they were paid $15 an hour, but now you're paying them 20 because maybe it's even your normal raise cycle for some reason, then uh, you actually have to limit the amount of the credit to the $15. So after a while, you're capped at 10,000 of wages anyway. Um, so over time, this limit won't necessarily make an impact. But it is interesting that they provided this limitation, which is a little unusual for um, the types of credits we're normally used to working with. Uh, so next, just we a wanted quick to question. Uh, uh, We've seen, and, and you've, you've uh, done some presentations on opportunity zones for us, uh, but we've seen with the, the, big, the big tax reform bill that it took the IRS about, I don't know, five or six months to actually define uh, how a lot of that applied. Do you anticipate with all of these relief programs that uh, they're going to be uh, constantly readjusted right up until the time that uh, uh, the people file their returns. And we're already really seeing that. And, and again, I have to check it on a, on a daily basis because there's not really a notification system generally um, that that will sort of alert you to a change. Luckily, they are dating the FAQs online, so then you know if it's sort of dated the last time you checked. Um, and then they're dating questions that change, uh, so you can at least find them that way. Um, but it, but I, I think they're they're already a little quicker than they were on the opportunity zone side, and even on the the new market credit side when that first program first came out, because they really had to be because they couldn't wait, given that uh, companies can take immediate benefit as they're paying their employees to not pay that amount in for payroll taxes in this case. Um, what we are very anxiously awaiting though is additional guidance on PPP loan forgiveness. It's really uh, lacking sure. in that area and the eight, eight weeks has already started ticking for many companies. Well, this is, this is what I was driving at before. It, it seems like they built into all of this uh, and all of these programs, uh, sort of a, a time bomb, if you will, that people <laughs> well, that's find why out. Really I mean, if people discover at the moment their uh, their PPP loan expires, uh, I apologize for the beep here. Somebody might be calling. Uh, if they discover that they're, they're suddenly, uh, you know, they're ineligible for forgiveness, uh, 
uh, you know, that and the moving up the deadline on the uh, deferred stuff could could really suck a lot of companies, I would imagine. Yes, it definitely builds the anxiety in, into the economy overall. And we're already seeing that on the PPP side where they're, you know, allowing people to pay it back under a safe harbor. They even moved the date now. They had May 7th. Now I think it's May 14th for companies to pay it back or they're actually threatening kind of criminal prosecution. You've probably seen some of the Treasury secretaries um sort of very public comments and the, the headlines for some of the public companies that, that receive the benefit. Um, but before we get into this program, Jack, I did want to make sure, are there any other retention credit questions before we move on? We may have time for one or two. One or two. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions on the uh, retention credit at this point. And that was me fumbling around with the volume in the background to see if I could get rid of that beep, but it looks like they're gone. So please continue. Excellent, thank you. So the CARES Act added a provision to an already existing SBA loan program that la allows for up to $10,000 of advance. And so here was another one where they kind of changed things as they went along. They decided this up to 10,000 was going to be based on the lower of 1,000 per job or $10,000. So obviously if you had five employees and it was and it was all just a heads and noses test. It didn't matter if it was full or part time, then you would receive five thousand. Again, five people, five thousand. If you had twenty people, you would receive the the ten thousand, the the lower amount. And then they advertised that it would come out within seventy two hours. So again, this was March twenty seventh when it was passed. It was going they the application opened up the following Monday I was really impressed that government was kind of working over the weekend to put together the, the updated application in place. Um, but then we quickly saw that unfortunately it was not paid out that quickly. It really almost took about two weeks for companies to start seeing this um, money. And then it also ran out pretty quickly. Phase two added additional funds for the advance, but because they had such a backlog, they haven't reopened up the IDL or EIDL applications for the advance, uh, which you're also applying for kind of one of their standardized loans. Um, they've opened it only back up for the agriculture um, businesses. So if you went to the website right now, it's only open for the agriculture. M many people think this program won't be opened up at all. I actually think once they um, if the agriculture doesn't take up a big chunk of it, that, that it likely will quickly open back up. Um, when you look at the Treasury website and it talks about this program, it actually doesn't even mention the limitation on the agriculture. And it'll take you straight to the application to apply, which looks like the regular application. But when you go to the SBA's website, it's pretty clear they're wanting to, to limit it. Um, they did come out and say any uh, idle application that starts with a three, the beginning number three, continues to be in process. And then I listened last week to an SBA uh, webinar. All the regional ones are hosting them almost every other day. And they actually said if your application starts with a two, that you should go ahead and reapply, even though it's not clear on the on the website, but they were encouraging everyone that had sort of applied maybe early on to, uh, and they haven't received funding that they did need to go ahead and, and kind of reapply. So we do have a number Leah. of, um, yeah. Excuse me, Leah, I just had a, a quick question. What happens if uh, companies that have been approved for the aid reopen before the, uh, during the time in which uh, the, the aid is covered? That, well, they'll uh, only be allowed to apply once if they've been approved and received the funding. They'll only be eligible for one time. Currently. All right, but my understanding is some of these programs are compensating people for being out of work. What if they go back to work? Uh, I mean, do they do they have an obligation to uh, to cut off the assistance? Well, that'll get a little bit into the the 
PPP type program. And uh, the interesting thing on the EIDL Advance, that they will generally fund that right away, but the actual loan portion that you're evaluated for, if it looks like you have ca significant cash reserves to cover your working capital for a couple months, they actually won't loan you the funds. Or if you're kind of back up and running and you j don't show a need, uh, the SBA will not grant you the, the loan application, but you, you're still eligible for the advance that you received, and that does not have to be paid back. The interesting interplay here, though, with the PPP program is if you received both the IDL and advance and the PPP, your loan forgiveness on the PPP side is immediately reduced by your EIDL advance, so a maximum of 2000 Some, Someone just asked, were you just saying they have to reapply for EIDL or PPP? I think you were talking about PPP. Well, the so if your loan application starts with a 2, then you would reapply for EIDL. If it okay. starts with a 3... <laughs> You're, you're in process, you do not need to reapply. All right, I got you. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, yeah. You've, you've got about uh, a little bit less than, you know, between 10 and 15 minutes, so uh, just to move the slides forward. Yes, so I do, So if you have any idea, we've noted here the phone number and the website, which most of our questions deal with how do I um, find out sort of my status. But a lot of times they've kind of hired new people and they can just say you're in process. Um, but again, we wanted to use the remaining time to discuss the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection. And generally, uh, most companies by this point have hopefully applied. Uh, they've opened up the types of lenders, including uh, PayPal, QuickBooks, Cabbage, Bofi, they're all accepting kind of these online applications. We've seen a lot of headlines that the larger banks would only accept current business account customers. And then it did seem like they even may have prioritized the amount of requests, so not necessarily uh, first come, first serve. So there's there's been a lot of uh, discussion regarding that. But for this portion of the program, we that, wanted that to would be the uh... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say Go we're going to focus on the loan forgiveness planning, assuming that they've received the PP, PPP funds. But go ahead, Jack. Did you have another question? No, I, was, I was just going to say that would those, those would be the banks that we bailed out. Uh, what was it in 2008? That's right. I think we're going to see a lot of interesting. Um, continued dialogue there regarding the program. The the interesting thing though is they are they're currently at least half of the phase uh, four funding continues to be available. There's lots of applications still in process. We um a lot of organizations like PayPal continue to take applications knowing additional funding was coming. So given that backlog they thought maybe it would run out a lot sooner than it has. Um, but so well, they've far, also uh, they're they're also permitting uh, financial institutions like uh, you know the investment houses like Goldman Sachs are are participating in this. Yes, they've expanded that, which is helpful. And then my smaller businesses have actually had the most success and the quickest approval and funding from smaller local banks and credit unions. Community, and this community is one where. Sure. Yes, and this is one, too, where not-for-profits can participate. I asked my local church, and they had just been approved um, on the first round of funding, and they tend to have smaller banks and, and have had, had success, and they obviously have payroll on their books as well. Um, but looking at th this one is much more limited in the types of funds that it can be used to pay for. And even though loan forgiveness is over the eight weeks, you, if you, to the extent you don't utilize your um, PPP funds on salary, rent, and utilities over the eight-week period, then 
Um, obviously, you can continue paying salary after that. It just becomes a normal loan at 1% paid out over two years. Uh, but here is sort of a note. One of the questions you had asked about, um, Jack, I think actually before we even started uh, the webinar today, the salary includes you know, the uh, portion that you pay the employee, health care costs on the employer side, and then state and local payroll taxes, but not the federal portion of employer taxes. It's also capped for individual on up to the hundred thousand per person. So there's uh, not clear guidance on how that's to be applied over the eight weeks. The most conservative would be to look at a weekly type payroll. So if you take the hundred thousand and divide that by 52 weeks, you're at about 1,900 of payroll. Uh, there's currently, and again, it could change, especially to the extent large businesses are taking advantage, but to where um, limiting bonuses and raises that are paid during this period. But again, there's currently no limitation, and some of our smaller businesses that have been paying um, uh, you know, sort of minimum type wage. There's a lot of competition with either the Amazons or the large grocery stores of the world, and they've had to pay them more to to retain their employees. Um, so currently, there's no limitation on that. But I, again, I have to almost caveat everything loan forgiveness related to say it's based on current guidance or, or really what we know today. Uh, we talked about it being deferred for six months. Um, if you want to really start a tracking schedule um, based on the date that you receive the payment and predict out what you'll be paying out over the initial eight weeks. There's a lot of discussion trying to move this eight week period because some not all businesses were open. And actually, the the Treasury, um, for the guidance they came out with the 75%, the Congress actually wasn't happy because that was not in the program because they recognized that not all businesses were open and they may need that the funds to, to pay rent, for example, um, just to be able to open when, when they were allowed to do so under kind of government order. Um, the other interesting thing is they've come out and said that the forgiveness is not taxable, but then the IRS said, well, okay, well, then you can't deduct the salaries that, that these, this sort of free cash was used. We could see that change as well because, again, that wasn't kind of the intent of the original CARES Act, um, but it's just an interesting to see the interplay between the IRS and Congress and um Jack mentioned I'm a CPA, but we frequently find that you know the uh, either Treasury or Congress will provide a benefit on one side, and then the IRS will overly limit it, unfortunately, um, at times. The other thing we don't have a definition on yet is um, how to define full-time equivalents. We're assuming that full-time will stand for uh, employees that work more than 30 hours because the government has used that for other purposes of defining full-time, but again, that's something else that we're we're waiting on. Um, also, if your loan is forgiven, then the corresponding interest portion is as well. Of course, if you're working at home, it's 24-7, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, some of us are definitely working more than we did before. Um, but the other interesting thing, too, is if uh, if you haven't applied yet, there is a um, Paycheck Protection Loan Finder on the SBA website. Wanted to point that out. Um, this is what some of the headlines have received. Uh, really, uh, anyone, in my opinion, that's received a loan over a million, although a lot of the guidance has uh, so far said two million, they've started to come back and say they'll likely look at others. Um, and that they your the certification on the application noted that the current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. So then they came out and said, well, generally large public businesses have access 
to other means of funding, whether they issue more uh, more stock, if they've got lines of credit, and so they or really if Magic encourage Johnson. Uh, Magic Johnson takes care of the uh, paychecks for the Lakers. Uh, that's right. Uh, they so they wouldn't have needed that of- loan then. That's right, and so they've given them the ability to pay that back. Now I think the new date is May the the 14th, um, but generally, also if it looks, if you thought you were going to have economic uncertainty, you really need to document your economic conditions because by the time we get out eight weeks to 12 weeks when the bank starts asking you questions, they're going to want to know your state of mind at the time of the application. And so you'll want to document how you were impacted. If your business sales are actually up, uh, you've had to hire people to keep up with demand, um, even though you were sort of uncertain at the time, that um, I think, unfortunately, they're going to use some hindsight to say, well, really, you did not, did not need this loan, unfortunately. I've talked to a couple of tax-exempt organizations as well that have been able to raise funds subsequent to the application, and so now they're kind of evaluating what what does this mean for them. And I know we're kind of coming up on time here, so I'll go a little bit Mm -hmm. quickly. Um, Other thing to keep in mind, which was really interesting, this question 40, so this is a different FAQ. These are the ones related to the Treasury on the PPP program. So um, if you hire your, your people back by June 30th, uh, and the other thing we're expecting is uh, you, you likely have to retain them for a period of time. So just because you hired them on June 30th and you let them go July 15th, will that still qualify? I mean, under under the guidance today, it technically would. They likely will kind of shut that down. But they but then it's like, well, what if I can't hire my people back? I shouldn't be penalized because they won't come back to work because unemployment's higher. Uh, their unemployment compensation. So now they've come out and said, okay, if you try to hire someone back and they say no, document that and it won't count against you for your headcount for loan forgiveness. But then, of course, they throw in there, you know, now that employee will no longer be eligible for continued unemployment compensation. So uh, I, I just found this question kind of interesting there. Kind of keep that in mind. Uh, make sure just to keep copies of everything. You can't just provide a schedule to your bank and say, "Well, look, I, I paid out all my fifty thousand." You have to show them how you paid it out over the eight-week period, and we're assuming it'll be on a cash basis. So you actually wrote a check, and ideally, the check was cashed in this eight-week period. We get a lot of questions saying, "You know, I received my funding." on a Thursday and I paid payroll the next day on a Friday. Does that count You know, to the um, employee? And based on current guidance, we think it should because even though it was for services before the PPP loan, but that could be something they they change they change as well. But I think it'll be harder Aaliyah? if they look. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're coming up on our uh, our time limit. Just want to let you know. You got about a minute. Okay. okay, thank you. So again, just wanted to remind everyone that if you received EIDL and PPP, and this we have a quick example here. If you received ten thousand EIDL, and fifty thousand from PPP, you do not pay the advance back at all to the SBA, but you do have to pay back ten thousand to your PPP bank assuming that um, you are eligible for full forgiveness. You received 60000 of funds here, but you will have to pay back 10000 to the PPP bank. Mm-hmm. I think that generally covers our discussion. Okay. We've talked thank about you, Aaliyah. Other- I, want to, I, I want to thank you for a very uh, informative presentation. I want to let everybody know that uh, uh, Leah's presentation, this this webinar will be uh, archived on the businessfacility.com website, and we can also send you the uh, the PowerPoints that we used. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Helene Kazeltine, uh, the Economic Development Director of the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce in sunny Florida. Helene? 
Thank you, Jack. And it is a beautiful Chamber of Commerce day today, too. Um, our chamber is the primary EDO. We work on behalf of the county commissioners. And just for some background, our economic mainstay here in our county are tourism and agriculture. So that shows why it's so important for us to diversify, uh, especially in light of any kind of disasters. Plus 97% of our local businesses are very small with less than 50 employees. So the fact that we are located on Florida's East Coast along the Atlantic Ocean, yes, we have seen our fair share of disasters, primarily hurricanes. And I will tell you that recovery and resilience really are in our collective DNAs because of that. Um, immediately when the pandemic hit the states and hit Florida, Governor DeSantis activated the Florida Bridge Loan Program. $50 million was allocated and it provided up to $50,000 in short-term interest-free loans to small businesses with two to 99 employees. Over a thousand loans were processed within a week. In our tri-county area or tri-county region, about $3.2 million was allocated to our businesses. Um, now the governor has begun a phase one partial reopening last week. Um, it included limited, or, limited indoor uh, restaurant seating, some expanded outdoor dining. It's the perfect weather for that right now. Um, our county relaxed any restrictions that might have been in existence for outdoor dining, like you don't have to get any special permits or anything, as did some of our municipalities. Um, we work very closely with our regional economic development partners like the SBDCs, the bankers, our workforce reps, to help our local businesses apply to those programs that Aliyah mentioned. Um, and we promote all those programs and the resources on our economic development website. Um, it's right there on the homepage. It's updated almost daily. And we also promote through our social media platforms. I do a lot of interviews on our local radio stations, emails, phone calls, of course. Um, for example, we contacted over 100 local businesses that had completed the state's business damage assessment survey. And what we did is provide them info on those loan programs that Aliyah mentioned, walk them through the process, directed them to who would be a good contact for them to help them further. Um, we're working with our regional planning council execs to expand a revolving loan fund for our businesses. Um, there's one in South Florida right now, but it would include our region up uh, a little bit further north. So it'd be a seven county revolving loan fund program using that EDA money that was just announced last week. So we've up also uploaded a list of about 120 local restaurants to the Chamber's website, showing what their status was, open and close, takeout delivery. Um, and then we also use that list to upload to our GIS-based economic development website. And that one also includes the geographic pinpoint locations of each of those restaurants, um, plus their contact information. Now we're gonna do that same type of GIS upload for all of our chamber members, about 700 businesses here in the county, um, with all their contact info, links to their websites and so forth. And eventually over the next several weeks, we're gonna offer this to all of our businesses here in the county. We've got about 7,000. And that's at no cost to the business. Um, the chamber does a weekly social media, has, has a social media schedule. We have takeout Tuesdays and what's for dinner Fridays. Um, and each one of those posts highlights one of our local restaurants. Um, we also have member Mondays, and you'll, you're seeing the visual right now. So uh, us as staff, we're going out in the community and taking pictures of our, our business members. And with that sign that you see, and we're posting that on social media too and tagging the business um, because we miss them. We do, we haven't had to have, we haven't been able to have any events for a while. Um, we also reached out to our manufacturers here in the county to see um, who could provide um, assistance in providing the PPEs. And a lot of them were already doing it. They were providing, they were either retooled or reassigned their workforce to make the plastic face coverings or the cotton face masks 
Um, one company um, is making surgical gowns. Another one is making ventilators. Um, and then also a lot of local companies are doing fundraisers. Um, some of our restaurants, especially the pizza places, are doing a match with one another, kind of a challenge to help out our restaurant employees because they were the ones that were hurt the most. Um, so right now we're also, um, we have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday morning, working with our key um, industry leaders um, from across all industry sectors to see what are those concerns as we slowly and responsibly open up our county, you know, of course, keeping in mind the governor's guidelines, but what are those concerns? How are we communicating with our employees and our customers? And what is this going to look like over the next several months? So thank you for the opportunity. And I really enjoyed the webinar, some really good information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helene. Thank you uh, very much, and uh, we hope everyone uh, listening will stay safe and well. That concludes today's COVID-19 response and recovery webinar. We'll be in touch with all of you uh, when we have the details for our next webinar, which we expect to be in June. And uh, I promise I will figure out how to uh, stop my phone from beeping in the middle of it. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.